Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about tonight's sponsor, HelloFresh. The holidays are just around the corner, and HelloFresh makes this busy time of year easier than ever, with chef-crafted recipes and pre-portioned ingredients, delivered right to your door so you can spend less time planning and more time prepping. Cozy up with seasonal favorites like cowboy turkey, black bean chili, mushroom ravioli, and kale and walnuts, and sweet corn and green pepper chowder. In this particular case, I just happen to pull out the very first set, which is meatballs. Quality is HelloFresh's priority. Ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days. So you know, they are guaranteed fresh. I've been eating these HelloFresh meals uh, for the past couple of months, actually, and they've made this hectic time for me a, a, a significant amount easier. My family gets a little bit picky about things, but everything seems to fit in. I, for one, can't have seafood or fish, and they accommodate. So if you'd like to join me for dinner and some of these great meals, go over to HelloFresh.com and use code CREEPYPASTA70 for 70% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com. The coupon code is CREEPYPASTA70, like you see on your screen, and you'll get 70% off plus free shipping. And now that dinner's ready, without further ado, on to tonight's story. I'm not too ashamed to say that I... I made some stupid decisions in my teenage years. And most of them resulted in little more than scrapes and stories. Though on more than one occasion I found myself in the back of a squad car pleading my case with an annoyed sheriff. Now, me and my buddies would have told you that for the most part. We were relatively harmless. But one day, early in my senior year, I had an experience that still haunts me. A memory that I can't look at directly without a wave of goosebumps sweeping over my skin. Travis was the one who suggested, of course. Travis, the undisputed king of horrible, awful, awesome ideas. Travis, who once suggested tying sleds to the back of his truck while he did burnouts in a snow-covered parking lot. It's been nearly 20 years, I'm still picking pieces of gravel out of my elbows from that one. That's not the memory that keeps me up at night. No, I earned those mental scars on crisp fall afternoons, Still a month from the year's first snow. Travis had approached me and two other friends after football practice. His trademark chipped front tooth making him seem like a crazed moonshiner. I know what we're doing tonight, he'd say. The hotel down Highway 43 got bed bugs. We're going there with Leah and her friends. I shot him a quizzical look. You want to get bed bugs? What are you, stupid? He asked. No, they're not gassing the bugs out until later this month. In the meantime, the entire place is deserted. We're going to go swimming in the indoor pool. My uncle worked on their AC system a few years back. He said they never locked the back door to the pool house. My still underdeveloped brain did a quick risk assessment. Not about whether we should trespass and risk arrest, but whether I'd be able to lie to my old man about our plans for the night. I figured it was about even odds, so I agreed. Travis swung by my place later that night in the truck. Unfortunately, my papa's out of the church activity. If he'd been home, maybe he would have stopped me. Maybe I wouldn't have gone into that pool. Maybe none of what was to follow would have happened. I suppose there's no point in going down the long list of what-ifs. I joined a half-dozen friends in the bed of his truck, holding on for dear life as he careened down Main Street. The night was warm for early October, but the wind whipping across the bed of the truck was still cold and crisp on my bare legs below my swim trunks. We passed by a house where Leah, Travis's girlfriend, was waiting along with a few more girls and two cases of beer. The hotel was dark when we arrived, its faded facade looking even more forlorn and forsaken than usual. Most of the windows had already been covered in the black plastic sheeting to prepare for the bed bug fumigation that would soon occur, cutting out almost all light. Not the pool house, though. No, the interior of the pool house shone with a faint neon green light. We poured out of the truck with our cans of beer, peering through the still-locked glass doors and the pool that lay beyond. The mysterious neon green light was emanating from a few exit signs hanging above the interior doors. Travis shook out his shoulders and ran at the fence, leaping over it with a few confident motions before disappearing behind the pool house. A few seconds later, what sounded like a heavy door opened on the other side of the building. He reappeared inside the pool house under one of the exit signs, the hazy green washing out the color of his appearance. He approached the door where we waited, 
then popped it open with a grin that displayed his half-tooth. I'd like to tell you that I felt some sense of foreboding, that I was nervous, that I had some inkling of what was going to happen. Wish I'd felt something to clue me in. Maybe if I did, I'd feel better about swimming nowadays. I didn't. We all immediately jumped into the water in a cacophony of screams and shouts. A game of chicken was set up almost immediately. Jane, one of Leah's friends, hopped on my shoulders, fighting with Travis and Leah. We gave a valiant effort, but eventually lost when Travis swept my leg. At the time, it just felt like another night in a small main town. I got out of the water and downed another long sip of warm beer before walking over to the deep end. The signs along the side of the pool warned me, in no uncertain terms, that diving was prohibited, that the water was only six feet deep, that serious injury could occur, perhaps due to the pleasant tipsy sensation I was beginning to feel. I dove into the dark green water anyway. I opened my eyes underwater expecting to see little more than green-tinged darkness, but instead of the dim bottom of the pool, I saw the shimmering surface of the water. And beyond that bright lights. I swam toward it, immediately confused. Had I turned around somehow? and Had someone turn on the lights? I rubbed the water from my eyes as my head broke the surface of the water, pure confusion taking over me. I was floating in a pool, but, it's... but I was no longer in the pool house, surrounded by my friends. Instead, I was treading water in a brightly lit pit, flanked by four high square walls that extended up at least 40 feet to several large fluorescent lights on the ceiling above. I swam over to one of the walls looking for an exit or a place to rest. The walls consisted of smooth tiles and grout, the kind you'd see in a nice bathroom. I slowly swam around the four sides but found no purchase, no exit, no markings of any kind. Hello? I shouted. My voice bounced off the walls, returning my own greeting back to me from every angle. I is anyone here? Again, my voice echoed back for nearly ten seconds before fading into silence. Not silence. Even at this distance, the incessant buzz of the fluorescent lights overhead was faintly audible over the sound of my treading water. The next several minutes passed with me alternating between calling out for help trying to wake up from whatever this nightmare was. My arms and legs were already beginning to ache. If I didn't get help soon, I'd drown. I thought back to my dive, back to when I'd first seen the shimmering surface of the water. I had seen it where I expected to see the bottom of the hotel pool. That didn't make sense to me, but a new thought suddenly occurred to me. I stuck my face into the water and looked down. The water was at least 20 feet deep but at least it was clear. The tile walls continued down below the surface, and there, way down at the dark bottom of the pool, the ground shimmered, almost as if it was the surface of water. I felt myself begin to hyperventilate, so I took a deep breath and leaned to float on my back. The water rushed over my ears, replacing the sound of buzzing lights with a thunderous pulse of my own heartbeat. I floated on my back for what felt like an eternity, but it was probably no more than 90 seconds when my heart rate had slowed from a thundering to merely drumming. I took a deep breath, then dove down and began swimming towards the shimmering surface far below me. The pressure built up in my ears, but I knew enough to blow out my nose to equalize. After a few final panic strokes, I reached the surface of the water at the bottom of the pool and burst through. There was no neon green light on the other side. No sounds of my friends, nothing but pitch black darkness and echoing drips as my breath returned. Gasping and sputtering, I appeared to be in a cramped concrete tunnel of some kind. The walls were rough and met in an arch just a few inches over my head. Hello! I called out again. My voice shot down the tunnel in either direction, bouncing off the raw concrete as it traveled out into the distance. After a moment of terrified thought, I picked one direction as forward and started swimming, all too aware of my rapidly decreasing energy. I did my best to move straight, 
but in the pitch blackness, I still found myself bumping my head into the concrete arch when I drifted off course. I was bringing my foot forward to pull another stroke when my hand suddenly hit the tendrils of something organic and sticky. I jerked away in a panic, bumping my head hard against the concrete ceiling. My left hand swung towards the other wall of the tunnel, where yet more organic tendrils awaited me. They reminded me how the octopus tentacles at our local aquarium felt wrapped around my hand when I visited back in elementary school. I, I paddled water for a moment, slowly reaching out. The entire surface of the concrete walls below the water was covered in organic tentacles. And the worst of it, off in the distance ahead of me, a distant metallic clinking sound grew steadily louder like iron chains scraping against concrete. The tendrils on the walls responded to the sound reaching out for me. The tunnel was still dark, pitch black, but I couldn't help but imagine some horrific creature making its way down the darkness of the tunnel towards me. Those horrible scraping chains were rapidly getting louder, but the echoing made it almost impossible to tell exactly how far. I dove down in the water, searching desperately for any light. There, some distance below me, I found yet another shimmering spot. I came up for a quick breath of air, the metal on concrete coming from close enough that I feared I'd touch it if I reached out a hand. With a terrified moan, I dove down once more, fighting off the organic stickiness that attempted to wrap around my arm. I burst through this new surface and was immediately grateful that there seemed to be at least some light in this new location, even if it wasn't the green neon lights that I had been praying for. I spun around, taking in my new surroundings. Judging by the sudden lack of echoes, I was outside in a large open body of water. It was still nighttime, just like it was back in Maine, but I appeared to be inside a fog bank that limited my visibility to just a few feet in every direction. A single hazy point of light, the moon, I assumed, shone through the fog in the distance. My arms, legs, and lungs burned in protest as I slowly treaded water. I paused for a moment, allowing the water to slip over my head, and fought back to the surface. I'd been trotting water for at least fifteen minutes without rest. If I didn't find a place to rest, I'd soon drown. The thought surged a shot of adrenaline through me. Help! I shouted. Is anyone there? The words had barely escaped me when the fog bank rolled past, giving me a clear view of my surroundings. I was treading water on the calm surface of a lake. All around me, fog banks were moving across the surface of the water like implacable glaciers slowly sliding down a mountainside. And off in the distance, I caught sight of a large metal truss bridge hanging perhaps 20 feet over the surface of the water between the fog banks. I immediately swam towards it, hope rising in my chest. When I thought I would be in earshot, I began shouting again, calling for help. I looked closer as I came to a stop underneath the bridge, staring up at its rusted underside. There were shapes hanging under it, shapes that... My blood ran cold. The shapes were bodies. At least a dozen bodies were chained hanging upside down under the bridge, swaying in the chill fall breeze. Most were decayed, but several still had skin. One of the newer bodies was a young girl, no older than eleven. I, I stopped swimming, staring up in horror. The pause caused me to sink, almost dipping below the water. The scraping metal sound, the same sound that I'd heard in the dark tunnel, it was coming from above the bridge. I felt my entire body tense up, and I dove down with only half a lungful of air, half choking on lake water. I didn't know what was making that sound, but I knew if I stayed under the bridge, I'd end up just like those poor people. I pulled at the water furiously, diving down towards what I prayed would be my friends. The lake water soon smothered any visibility from the moonlight, leaving me in pitch blackness. I continued to swim, to scan ahead of me for any shimmering water. My body rebelled, forcing me to take in a mouthful of water. I gagged, then turned back for the surface. For three strokes, I feared that I'd gotten turned around, that I was moving down or worse sideways. But no, on the next stroke I saw a faint flash of moonlight. I swam like mad and burst through the surface, coughing and sputtering. I threw up into the lake, most of it water. I spun trying to get my bearings. He was staring at me from where he hung between the bodies under the bridge. I say he because 
because he was wearing a, a man's suit coat and slacks as if it were from the 1800s. But I don't think he was human. Humans have eyes, not pits. Humans have fingers attached to their hands instead of chains. Humans can't smile the way he was smiling. He was hanging from his right hand, chains wrapped around a truss. The chains of his other hand reached out and pushed around a few of the bodies like a child swatting a wind chime. Then he reached for me. The chains holding him to the bridge slowly uncoiled, lowering him towards the surface of the water. The chains on his other hand spread out, snaking towards me with a supernatural speed. I didn't have a master plan. All I knew was that I would do anything rather than be caught, including drown. I took a single sharp gulp of air, then dove down just before the chains reached me. I swam faster and deeper than before, the adrenaline coursing through my veins like fire. Seven strokes, eight, eleven, fifteen, twenty-three. He still hadn't caught me. He was probably waiting for me to reemerge. I, I wasn't going to. I continued to pull, my lungs burning, my already tired arms begging me to stop. My lungs gave an involuntary gulp again, but this time I was ready and locked my jaw and lips. Thirty-eight strokes. Forty-five. I was starting to lose consciousness, but I was fairly certain I was still swimming straight down at least. At last. There, at last, I saw light shimmering, neon green light. Darkness crowded at the edge of my vision, but I blew what little air remained in my lungs out in a cacophony of bubbles. And the next thing I knew, I was sputtering water and coughing on a cold concrete floor. I spun around and saw Travis along with my friends each watching me with a concerned expression. Dude, Travis said. Where have you been? Don't dive into the water, I said between retching coughs. Don't go into the water. We're coming around the bend to holidays. Which means that I'm going to tell you guys about a book. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to tell you guys about two books. The Creative Pasta Collection, Volume 1 and Volume 2. It's available on Amazon right now. You can find a link to it in the description down below. And they are books that are curated by me. They're a couple years old, but recently one of them got published in Japanese, which is interesting. I don't think you can buy it, but... I mean, if you're in Japan and you see it, I, I hope you think. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting... <laughs> for me to update my Patreon, and I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Donna Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Aka Limchok, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Corey Kenshin, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Paulson, Darth Myber, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Fester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Gorag Tri Magazine, Grand Moth the Milky, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Sec Time, Insanity Gamer X, Jay Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Sloth, Crazy Kid, Cryolinian, Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kayo, Psychomo, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Stricken, Tali Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon, thank you all so, so much, and to everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>